All right. It's good to be with you again this morning. If you would, please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Mike, I think I'm actually on mic 1, if that's messing you up. Uh, Mark chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 14 through 29 this morning as we again continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. In 1843, Edgar Allan Poe published one of his most well-known and greatest works, The Telltale Heart. And in it, he details the ravings of a madman who's trying to convince you that he's not actually a madman. And he goes on to tell us exactly what happened. And it's kind of a very dark and sinister story as you read into and dig into with the things that he's going on here. But it's the, it, this particular person, he's a caretaker for an older man. And he actually has been very uh, faithful in doing that and executing his duties. But as he does this, as the man gets older and they spend more time together, he just suddenly has this desire to take the old man's life. And you would, be, you would think it was something to do with, like, he wants his money or his property or or status something or that he's been wronged in some way and simply even he himself doesn't quite get why he feels the way that he does but he finally convinces himself it has something to do with his eye just one eye is is different it's, it's kind of clouded over and just like big and beady and feels like it's just piercing down deep into his soul and it gets to the point where he just can't take it anymore he says i i, I can't do this i have to kill this man and so he details the way and trying to again tell you like i'm not actually crazy I mean, it took me a week to kind of work up to the point where I could actually do this. And he keeps going on and on like this. And finally, in the middle of the night, he does exactly that. And he kills this man. And he then decides, well, I have to hide the body. And so he goes about dismembering the body and burying him in the floorboards in the very home, his very room in which he had, had been sleeping. He thinks he's gotten away with it. But then suddenly there's the knock at the door. And the police have been alerted because the neighbor next door heard the shriek of the old man during the incident and sent the police on their way. And so, but this man is so convinced that he's gotten away with it, that he's done such a great job. He invites them in and says, I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to hide. And he shows them all around the house and all of the various rooms and all the various places. And finally, they end up in his bedroom, in the very room in which he was murdered. This man was murdered and in the very room in which the man is now underneath encased and in, in entombed in the floorboards of this room. And he sets up chairs in there and serves them tea. And he puts his very own chair on top of the very place upon which he has just buried the man. And they begin just having a conversation. But as the time goes on, there's just this, this weird, dull noise in the background. And he can't quite describe what exactly it is, but it's starting to annoy him. And it's slowly getting louder and louder and more ob obnoxious in, in what's going on here. And it's like he finally realizes what it is. It's the heartbeat of the old man in the floor. And he's convinced that the police are going to sit there hearing, hearing this with him and know like something's up. And he, he starts doing everything he possibly can. He starts talking louder. He starts making jokes and running around the room and dragging furniture across the floor, thinking they're mocking him. Surely they hear this and they're waiting for him to break and waiting for him to crack and, until he finally confesses what's been going on. And they just go on as if not everything's just fine and normal. And finally, he can take it no more. And he stands up in a rage and says, fine, it's me. I confess. I'm the one who killed him. He, he, he's here beneath the very floorboards in this room. See, it's the power of a guilty conscience that finally is his undoing. And our story is kind of in the same vein as this. Except our character, Herod, is not dealing with a heartbeat beneath the floorboards, but he's hearing about the rumors of the man that he has had killed walking about the streets of, the, of Israel. And there's a ping and a, and a tinge of guilt that comes to rest upon him, I think, as well. And here's the thing. If you thought the man in Edgar Allan Poe, Poe's story was a madman or crazy, how much more so Herod? Yes, he killed a man simply because he didn't like the look of his eye, but Herod killed a man who was telling him how he could have eternal life. Now that's a madman. But that's exactly what has taken place in our story. He killed a man, not because he was telling him this, but it was a man who was telling him that how he could have eternal life, how he could have forgiveness and live forever with God for all eternity. And he killed him 
without ever turning, without ever confessing. And all of this really highlights the, the, the reason why Mark puts these stories together. This is another one of those passages where you have a story within a story. We looked at the previous story last week without mentioning this fact, but, but if you've been paying attention to Mark, he likes what they call these Markin sandwiches, where Mark will start a story, throw in a different story, and then finish that sto the, the original story again. We did that here. Remember that Jesus had to send the disciples out and going around in twos and says, go and do ministry. Leave all your other worldly goods behind. Don't take your money with you. Don't take your extra robes. Don't take extra even sandals or shoes or food. Just go and serve. And they did and they came back and they're successful. We found that in verse 30. But this is the story that separates those things. And it's, you, at first glance, you wonder like, why did Mark do that? Because it's kind of weird. And they don't feel like they're re related, but I think they are. Sometimes following Jesus and being his disciple means that there are good times and success and conversions and things go well for you. But sometimes it means sitting in a prison cell waiting for your execution. And at the end of the day, that's what both of these individuals were doing. They were living the life that God had for them. They were serving God, and yet the outcomes could not be more different. And Mark wants you to understand, just because you're serving God doesn't mean everything's just going to go well for you your entire life. It could end your life. But Jesus is worth it. Will you serve? Will you be the disciple that God has called you to be or not? And what makes your service even worthy is who you serve, not what it accomplishes. When you think about how long John the Baptist's life and how long his ministry really was, it's small. We know actually very little about John. And we can all be very dissatisfied sometimes with the stories that God has for each of us. But we shouldn't be. Because we don't always realize what God is doing through them. And in them, and sometimes very ordinary situations and very ordinary things can lead to amazing outcomes. And so we're going to look at this story, which actually starts with a flashback. So I'm going to tell it out of order, because I think it's more helpful for us in our outline, for me at least. And we want to see here that being a disciple means doing the hard thing. Being a disciple means that you might become a target of someone else. But it also means you might make people think. And all those are worthwhile. Let's read, even though our passage starts in verse 14, we're going to start reading in verse 17 and read through verse 20. For it was Herod who had, been, who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Being a disciple means having to do the hard things. It all starts with a confrontation. It all starts with a confrontation. We don't know exactly how and where and when that all happened, but we do know it did. But this is what happened. Herod, whose father was Herod the Great, you know, the one that had all of the little babies killed trying to get Jesus many years ago. That Herod the Great is this man's father. Herod, the one that's later going to be eaten by worms in, uh, I believe it's the book of Acts, that would be this guy's son. So they're all kind of featured in Scripture somewhere, and none of them in a good light. Let's put it that way. But here they are. And this particular Herod had violated the Jewish law. He had fallen in love with his brother's wife. And in order for them to be together, he realized he had to kind of manipulate the situation a little bit. And so he came, oh, she also happened to be his niece. Just in, in case you were wondering, uh, if you couldn't get more weird. But he does this, and so he falls in love with his brother's wife, and he convinces her, you divorce your husband, I'll divorce my wife, and then we can be together. And he does that. He divorces his wife. She goes away. And obviously that didn't sit well with her father. And then Herodias divorces her husband. And they come together. And they form this union, this marriage. And this is one of those situations where, you know, you look at this. And this would have been widely condemned by virtually everybody. This wasn't just like a Jewish thing. There was nobody that's going to hear this situation and think, yeah, that, that was, that's not good. That's what everybody's going to say in a situation like this. And John the Baptist is not going to let so blatant and so public a sin go on unchallenged. And so he approaches Herod at some point and challenges him for violating the law. And the question becomes specifically, which exact one? 
It's actually Leviticus 18, 16. It says this, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. And we don't necessarily always think in those kinds of terms, but truly the, 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 the two have become one flesh. He says, you know, to, to violate one is to violate the other one. It just not, ought not to be done. It's a shameful thing. It's depraved. That was actually says there in, in Leviticus later on. He said it's, it's shameful. It's actually listed as one of several reasons why God sent the Israelites to go into Canaan. It wasn't just to give them the land that he had promised, though it was. It was also exercising judgment against the many sins that the people of Canaan had done. They were an abomination in God's sight. And this is one of the very things that's listed in that list. You ought not to do that. And here we now have this man who's ruling over the Jews in this area doing that very thing in a very public manner. And John says, not on my watch. And he goes and he challenges him. And some have actually commented, they don't know why John actually bothered. I mean, this is the, the house of Herod was a mess. Uh, you might call in our today a hot mess. There was, they were known for their despicable behavior, their depravity over all, their, their lavish lifestyles and living. And really, they, they were converts to the, law, the Jews, the, the Jewish law, Judaism. They weren't native to that. That was something they adopted. But they weren't really good at following it. And they were constantly breaking those laws. And it's kind of like, John, you know, why did you even care? Why did you even bother? You could have just left that alone. And everybody would be like, well, it's just the Herods. Just, that's just what they do. That's who they are. John wasn't going to be comfortable with that. He challenged them, and he confronted them, and it didn't really sit well with Herodias, Herod's new wife. She didn't like this whole thing that was unfolding, and if all things being equal, she would have just killed him. She was just like off with it. I'm not listening to that. I'm not putting up with that. I'm just going to kill you, take you out. The problem was Herod was not so quick to move against the man of God. He's like, he's a, he's a holy man. It's like, I don't like what he's saying, but I'm not about to just raise my hand against God's man. And so rather than kill him, he just put him in prison. Because that's better. And it goes on. As we think about this, that afforded John a little bit of a, a fragile safety. Kept him out of the clutch as a little bit of Herodias. If you remember back in Mark chapter 1, we actually recorded John's arrest. It's so, so brief. It's, it's less, less than really a full verse. It just simply acknowledges, it says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. That's it. It's not until you get to Mark 6 here that we find some more of the details. But he's in prison. And Herod is at least afraid of him. And he didn't like what he had to say. But he didn't want to kill him either. He was thinking. He kept him this safe. And, and the strangest thing is that even as much as what John was saying bothered Herod, he didn't like it. He was strangely, strangely drawn to it. He wanted to hear more. It says he gladly listened to, and I think that helps us understand a little bit more what John was actually saying. You think about John and what we do know about him. You find him in the wilderness, and what is he constantly preaching? Repentance. Repentance. And then the Pharisees are coming out. What's he, he's calling on them all kinds of names. John's not afraid of anybody. He's not. He's not afraid of anybody. So we know that this, this is not some kind of a Joel Osteen kind of a prosperity gospel message. He's, he's a fire and brimstone kind of a preacher. That's what Herod's getting in his own basement. And he's hearing this over and over. And yet I think at the same time we can understand that, 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 that Herod, or, uh, John was doing this in a very winsome way. He wasn't out there just to condemn this man and challenge him and make him feel bad. He's like, look, you've got to turn from this. You've got to repent. I think he cared for him. Honestly, if he didn't really care for him, he would have just kept his mouth shut, but he didn't. He kept wanting him to repent. And it seems like at least Herod was semi-receptive. It's kind of similar. Do you remember in the, in later on, uh, I think it's in Acts, but with the Apostle Paul, that, that, that Paul has an audience with Felix. And they're constantly conversing. And granted, Felix was hoping for a bribe the entire time. But it says he was hoping for a bribe. But at the same time, he was strangely drawn to the message that Paul had. He wanted to know more. And even Herod's own son, later after him, Herod Agrippa, is looking at Paul. And Paul's telling him, you would have me to become a Christian. And Paul says, I would have everybody to be like me, except for these chains on my hands. I want you to be like me. They were semi-receptive, even though ultimately nothing seems to have come from any of those situations. But it's so heartbreaking for me because it feels like Herod was so close. It feels like he was so close to turning around. 
I think for him, the challenge was probably the challenge for many people. He wanted to hang on to his sin and hang on to Christ or religion or something at the same time and fighting and realizing you can't have actually both. God won't accept both. Honestly, your sin won't accept both either. They can't coexist. It's like having light and having darkness in the same room coexisting together. That can't actually happen. When you turn on the light, the darkness flees. When you turn off the light, the darkness comes back. It's all or nothing. There's nothing in between. You can't have both. You have to let go of your sin and bury it, get rid of it, have it forgiven, and you have God, or you can, or you can hang on to your sin and ignore God. You, you can't do both. And Herod, I think, is trying and wrestling with that reality because he really likes his sin, I think he's really curious and interested about God, too. He's like, I, I know I kind of should be here. I know I should do this. And it's really this challenge of what do you treasure most? And now as Herodias gets involved, I think we're reminded of a, another aspect that we sometimes, sometimes forget. That we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers in high places. And Herodias is going to become involved in this situation very, very soon and in many ways ruin his chances, if you will, of Herod's salvation or repentance. Nothing else I think we do always need to remember our leaders. We, of all people, should understand what they're truly up against and to pray for them accordingly because they have a heavy burden and sometimes fail to understand how the world actually works. Let's pray for them. But... As we see this, we see John very willing to do the hard thing. And he did it well, calling Herod to repentance. And I'm sure that as he's doing this, he knew that if this goes well, Herod could turn to the Lord and honestly turn many others with him. Can you imagine how different the Bible would read if Herod had accepted Christ? There might be entire chapters that would be completely different or missing or possibly different ones. He knew that if this went well, Ma massive things could change. But if not, if not, life could get really hard for John really fast. And it did. Being a disciple can make you a target. Let's read verses 21 through 29. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give it you, up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. It's a crime of opportunity. It's exactly what she wanted. John had been safe, but Herodias was not wanting him to stay that way. So Herod throws this birthday bash, this birthday party, pulls out all the stops, invites all these people over, and she hatches a plan. I don't think there's any way to look at this other than this was a setup. That as soon as she saw this, she says, I think I can trap him. I think I can get him to do what I want him to do and force him, kind of obligate him. So as Herod is planning the food and the wine, she's planning the entertainment. And she takes her own daughter and she parades her out there to dance for this party. You realize that I mean, Herod is inviting these people over. They're not necessarily just his friends. These are people that he wants to impress. These are people that he wants to be, be enamored by him. He wants to show off to them. And so truly he's doing all of these things to show, uh, show what he can do and what he can provide. And as she is dancing for them, one can only imagine the sensuality with which she danced to try to entice and amaze her stepfather as well as all of the guests. And it works. And you combine base passions and alcohol together and you have a bad combination. So here's Herod watching his own stepdaughter perform before him and said, hey, that was amazing. What do you want? 
You name it, you can have it. Half the kingdom, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. She runs and asks her mom, and without missing a beat, I want John's head. Now, I, I think maybe this daughter shared a little of the contempt that her uh, mother did, because she adds on a platter, which if you've ever heard or used that phrase, I want his head on a platter, that's where, this comes, that's where that comes from, here. I want it on a platter. I, don't know, I could just see Herod sitting there in his throne, like hearing this, all, and just the color draining from his face. This was not something he wanted to do. But he's kind of stuck, because he made a big promise, and he made it in front of a lot of people. He can't back out. Well, he could. He doesn't want to. He'll look foolish, and he is a fool. He's obligated himself exactly as Herodias wanted him to do. And so he goes, sends an executioner, gives the head to Salome, Herodias' daughter, who gives it to her mother. This is such a senseless and cruel act. And the only de decency that we find even in the entire passage is the last one in verse 29, where John's own disciples come and they gather his body and bury it in a tomb. It's, a, it's an act of decency or um, a compassion. And again, as you think about it, we find Herod violating, again, the very same passage in Scripture. Not only had he married his brother's wife, but the very next verse of Leviticus 18.17 says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. And perhaps he pays for that with his soul as he kills the one who promised him life, who was reasoning with him and challenging him, Repent, turn from your sin. And he didn't. But for John, we realize there are consequences for living as a disciple of Christ. Are you willing to accept them? Now, thankfully, they're not all bad. They're not all hard times and bad times. Many times, it brings much joy and happiness and blessing in our lives. It's nice when we have a hard time. Even we have somebody to turn to. We have somebody to cling to. It is not all bad. It's not all hard times and difficult times. But there are some and being a Christian can make you the target of someone's ire and hatred. And you do the right thing and you become hated for it, maybe even persecuted for it. And it will, in times like those, make you evaluate, who am I really living for? Why am I really doing this? Is Jesus worth it? You think John probably could have lived a little bit longer. He probably could have had a really fruitful ministry. Grown a bigger church, if you will. He could have done a lot of those kinds of things. Made a name for himself. Become famous doing all those kinds of things. But he would have missed out on sharing the gospel with Herod. He would have been disobedient in his responsibilities. And John's life was not what you would necessarily call glamorous or envious. But it was certainly spent in service of Christ. And that makes it good. Being a disciple can be a very precarious thing. But it will always reveal what you value most in life. Is it God or other? And John treasured Christ. And so being a target was nothing in comparison to having Christ. So doing the hard thing, being a target, not always fun, but not always bad. However, even in, after his death, John continues to have an impact because he made a lot of people think. And he's still doing it today. Let's go to the beginning, verses 14 through 16. This is the flashback that originally started this passage. It says, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. And some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he's Elijah. And others said, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. When you go back to 14, we start seeing these rumors that are swirling around. They're talking about, actually about Jesus, not John the Baptist. But here's this new guy that people are kind of becoming aware of. And just because of who he is and the things that he's been able to accomplish. And, and possibly even as the disciples, there's these rumors like, somebody new is here. Who is this person? And so the rumors swirl. It's actually John the Baptist. And he's back from the dead. And he, now he's got power. That was one option. Another one was simply that it's Elijah. It's Elijah, and there is reason for why people thought that, because back in, in Malachi 4, 5, there, were, there was uh, this, this idea that, that uh, Elijah would come kind of in the last days of the Lord. So there was an expectation that Elijah would come, and suddenly someone like that is here. 
or that he's just a prophet similar to Elijah and Elisha, doing great and mighty works, but it's kind of a, a new, old school kind of a prophet. But Herod's own ideas of who this is, is it's John the Baptist, the guy I killed. I can't imagine that didn't give him a couple sleepless nights and that he didn't again make him consider some of his life choices. And even the conversations that he had had with John prior to his execution, those times in prison or wherever they happened to be talking. I think John would have relished nothing more than to know that Herod was still thinking about the things that he had told him. The challenges and the way that he died and things that are going on now. And Herod's going, wow, what, what does this all mean? Thinking again about the message that John was, was had for him. And again, even though we don't know if anything actually comes of it, but he's thinking. But there's a bigger message to consider as well. That John's life, and even certainly his death, has made people think and consider once again John and what he stood for, who he was, what he said. And I think that's why Mark is picking up on this the way that he does. Mark has the longest handling of this particular event of any other gospel. Because I think in this, Mark saw something in John, especially in his death, that he wanted us to see too. He saw in John the Baptist the prefigurement of Christ himself. Think about it. John is an innocent man, not, not a guiltless man, but an innocent man as far as it comes to this. And yet his, his life will be taken from him for something he didn't do. Herod, like Pilate, did not actually want to execute his captive. Herodias plays the part of the chief priest who pressure the authorities to do what they don't actually want to do. John is taken and buried in a tomb by his followers. And though it is only a rumor, it is rumored that John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Does that sound like anybody you know? I hope so. Because John certainly, it certainly reminds of, of something for John, or for, uh, for uh, Mark. He's hearing all these things, he's seeing all these things, like, wait a minute, that's mirroring the very end of the life of Christ. Something's there. Something's... So, so John, or, uh, Mark is preaching, John is preaching a message, not only with the words that he spoke, but also with the death that he died. I think that's why Jesus later says in Luke 6, 7, 28, he says this of John, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. And that's Jesus saying that. Why does he say that? Because I think of the entire life that John the Baptist lived and what it said and what it represented. He showed us. He preached repentance and in death he showed us what was necessary to take away our sins. See, the thing is, repentance is necessary and it's important, but in and of itself, it's not enough. You can be sorry, you can try to be better, you can try to be different, but unless someone else pays for, an innocent party pays for your sin... Nothing changes. You're still in the same state. You're still in the same sinfulness. The law has to be satisfied because it's been broken. So what can satisfy the law? Excuse me, punishment has to be carried out. And of course, when John died, he couldn't satisfy that law. Because he's as good as John was, he wasn't sinless. He wasn't perfect. John was a sinner just like you and I. At some level, he deserved to die. Not necessarily for what this, these events, but he wasn't perfect. But Jesus later was crucified as an innocent man, and Jesus truly is the better John. He was all those things and more, and truly was raised from the dead. And his resurrection proves that he was that innocent, and it proves that we can actually have eternal life. Not just a rumor of being raised again, but an actual resurrection, an actual coming around. And if there is no resurrection, then you have to understand, there is no hope. There is no hope apart from a resurrection. I mean, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. In other words, if Christ is not raised from the dead, you are wasting your time this morning, right now. You're absolutely wasting your time. If this is false, if there's no hope here, if there's no resurrection, there, there's no point to any of this. We might as well go and enjoy this life to its uttermost because this is all there is. But if there is a resurrection, and there is, we have a hope for an eternal life in which we can be with God forever because of someone else's work. John shows us that a good man and even a godly man who was wrongly killed still died and if we, outside of Christ, if we are outside of Christ, we'd be the same. And we would stay that way. John pointed to Christ 
Because in Christ there is life. And if you're not in Christ, then you're still lost. You can be repentful, re repentant, repentant, sorry, apologetic for all those kinds of things. You can work yourself to the very bone and to its core, trying to serve God and trying to do all these things. But if you are outside of Christ, it means nothing. It means nothing. It's, you have to be in Christ. You have to be trusting and relying upon Him and Him alone. That's what John wanted us to think about as he lived out his story. That was his story and what's yours. That was the plan that God had for John. He accepted it willingly. What role does God have for you? And are you willing to accept it? Or are you going to try and run from it? I know it's easy to look around sometimes and think and wonder, why isn't that my life? Isn't that what we see Peter doing with John? Remember at, at the, at the, uh, after the resurrection and Peter's there on the shore and, and, and Christ is telling him, hey, I want you to know you're going to follow me. He's restoring Peter a little bit. And Peter looks at John, well, what about him? You're telling me I'm going to be crucified, but what about him? What about John? And he's like, what is that to you? Follow me. This is your story. You need to follow your story that I have for you. And he does. Jesus is going to look at all of us and ask us to serve him in the capacity that he asks of us. Not necessarily always what we desire, but what he wants, what he's going to use. Will you go and serve? Regardless of the outcome. Regardless of what it looks like. You think about John the Baptist, honestly, at the end of the day, was just a normal, ordinary guy. He wasn't special. He was just willing. And he served Christ. Ordinary people who sought to please Christ in everything they did. It gives you hope. You can do this too. Serve God in whatever capacity He has for you. And you might look at your life right now and think, it's not special, it's not great. Maybe it's not. But it's what you have. And you have to remember that discipleship and mission with Jesus is not always those good times. It's not always that, those conversions and successes and, and just the best life now and all those kinds of things. It's not always that. Sometimes discipleship and true mission is truly sitting in a prison cell waiting for your execution. But either way, it's worth it. You have to decide what king are you living for. The one that you stare at in the morning every time that you get up in the mirror? Or the one who reigns above? That Psalm 93 was telling us about. If you are not in Christ right now, then I will hope you consider that message. Because the only king that you can serve outside of Christ is the one you see in the mirror. And that king will fail you. Guaranteed. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you for this day that you have graciously given, that again, we do not deserve. I'm thankful for the life of John the Baptist, not because, Lord, it was overly exciting per se, or even difficult, but we see a man who was bound and determined to serve you to the absolute best of his ability, Lord, and it didn't necessarily work out in a way that any of us would really consider, that's what I want for my life. It was a hard life. From all the things that we know about him, from the clothes that he wore, the food that he ate, to the way that he even died. Lord, it was a hard life. And yet, Lord, we realize, as you called him the greatest son born of women, that what makes it so great was the fact that it was based upon who he served. Not what he even accomplished. Lord, we mourn for Herod so close. So close. And yet, Lord, so far, Lord, help us to live and accept the life that you have for us, to glorify you even in the small little moments that nobody even sees or realizes are there, that we would be faithful in those, consistent in those, and living for your glory. Lord, if there's anyone in this room that does not know you, they're outside of Christ, Lord, maybe they're toying with this idea like Herod did, thinking they had lots of time, thinking they can hold on to their sin and you in some capacity, or just maybe indifferent to the whole thing. Lord, I pray that you would convict them. Please, Lord, help them not to go from this place or leave this earth the way the Herod did, ex uh, rejecting you. Lord, I pray that you would help them to understand the gloriousness of the gospel, what it means to be forgiven, and a right relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, for one more opportunity to hear this truth. In Christ's name, amen.